people don't have any uh, central form of government other than the prophets who will uh, that God specifically spoke to like he did Moses uh, and Joshua and now they don't have a leader per se and so we come to the period of judges and the period of judges is going to be a really tumultuous period they, everything should you know God uh, delivered them from Egypt they uh, survived the 40 years wilderness wandering. They've conquered the land. They've divided the land up. And so everybody's got a new house and uh, 40 acres and a mule. And, uh, so everybody should be happy now, right? But uh, you've got chapter one of Judges is going to tell that there's still a lot that didn't get done. And so let's look chapter 1, and we won't go into as much detail later, but chapter 1 and chapter 2 really set the stage for uh, what we're going to be studying in Judges. Judges chapter 1, verse 1, after the death of Joshua came to pass, the children of Israel asked the Lord, says, who go up uh, for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And so they said, who's going to be our leader? We don't have a leader anymore. And so the Lord said, Judah will go up. I've delivered the land into his hand. In verse 3, Judah, we're going to see Judah inspires with Simeon. It comes to Simeon, that clan. He said, if you'll help me fight for my piece of land, then I'll help you fight for your piece of land. Anybody have any idea why he would pick Simeon? Think about it. We talked about it one time before. Simeon land is going to fall within the boundary of Judah. And so they're going to, they're going to be joined at the hill. And uh, so he comes to Simeon and they make an agreement. And so the two of them go up and they fight. Uh, verse uh, 4, Judah went up. The Lord delivered Canaanites and Perizzites into their hands and they killed uh, those in Bezek. So there was still a lot to be conquered, wasn't it? I mean, when Joshua ends, they've been assigned their land. They have essentially conquered enough that they can have a home, but they haven't driven out all the enemies yet. And we're going to find out more about that. And then it tells about one particular incident. I find this kind of interesting. Verse 5 through 7. Among those that they went up against was they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek. Now, the word Adonai is also applied to God. And so the word means Lord or ruler. And the city was Bezek. So this was the Lord of the city of Bezek. Adonai Bezek. So it's a title rather than a proper name. You with me? And he says, they fought against him and they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled. And they pursued after him, caught him, cut off his thumb and his big toe. Now think about that, what you got left. You know? and, and so when you eat from this time on, how are you going to eat? going to have to grab it like this, huh? It's going to be really crude. You're going to have to do it kind of like an animal. And so Adonai Bezek says, 70 kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their beef under my table. He was a bad dude, wasn't he? And he said, that as I have done, so God has requited me. So there's an incident within an incident here of a particular king, and they learned of the cruelty when he had conquered all these little city states went out to war against one another. There was a period, time of the year, that it was a time of war, and they would go out and see if they could conquer their surrounding city states. And so this guy evidently was pretty powerful because he had conquered seven. off their thumbs and their big toes. Now you, you think about what all that's going to do to you. And I 
They took it by the sword, by the edge of the sword, and they set it on fire. But obviously, there were still some powerful people. That a lot of people might give up this fight. Yeah, and you know, and we don't know how much time passed between verse eight and verse twenty-one. Uh, I mean, they could have come back in, uh, you know, after they had conquered the city. But I found it interesting. it's a powerful city. But when is it going to become really important to us? When David becomes king and he names it his capital. <coughs> that's when it's going to be important. But until then, it's not going to be Judges chapter 19, beginning in verse 10. Uh, this is, the setting here is going to be, there's going to be a Levite who goes to Bethlehem to uh, get his uh, wife, concubine. Uh, she left him, went back to her father's house. He goes back to get her. Do you remember that story? 
story. If you don't, we'll get across it here pretty soon anyway. So he's on his way back. He's got his contraband. He's on his way back. And verse 10, the man, uh, look at verse 9. Verse, from verse uh, 2 to verse 8, the concubine's father persuades him to stay the night. Don't leave yet. And he does it over and over until finally he says, no, we got, we're going. And so verse 9, the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine and his servant. His father-in-law, the damsel's father, said unto him, Behold, now the day draws toward evening. Stay all night. Behold, the day grows toward the end. Lodge here, that your heart may be merry, and on the morrow you can go your way. And the man said, No, I've been here long enough. Right. He would not stay that night. So they went home with him. Verse 22, and they were making their hearts merry. Men of the city, certain men of Belial, which would be the devil, they set the house round about, and they beat at the door, spoke to the master of the house, the old man saying, Bring forth the man that came with you into your house that we may know him. You know what that means, right? It's not good. It's not good. And the man, the master,
Those are fitting good pieces, ladies. Who did? Manasseh and Ephraim. All right. So at least one of those went up to destroy Bethel. You remember anything about Bethel? How did? When did we first hear about Bethel? Um, Jacob What does it mean? What does the word mean? God's house. saw angels ascending and descending on the ladder, right? Yeah. And he, he made uh, left a uh, memorial there of a rock. And he called the place Bethel, God's house. And that's where we were first introduced to it. And so now you, you see Bethel is uh, verse 23. They went to destroy Bethel and the name of the city before that I saw a man coming out of the city and said to him, show us the entrance of the city and we'll show you mercy and show them the entrance of the city. They smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let go the man and all his family. And the man went into the uh, in land of the Hittites and built the city and called it Luz, which is the name thereof to this day. So, it was formerly called Luz, and then he went and established another city and called it Luz. So, Verse 27, neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shion and her town. Uh, verse 28 says, it came to pass when Israel was strong, they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. So that's a statement that characterizes the whole situation. When they became strong, they drove them out, but they stopped before they drove all the inhabitants. I guess once they got it, you know, enough to satisfy their own uh, personal need, needs, and they didn't pursue it any further. Verse 29, neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites and dwelt in Ephraim, but the Canaanites dwelt in Ezer among them. Is that going to be a problem? That's going to be a problem. God's told them over and over and over and over and over again that. And then verse 30, neither did Zebulun. Verse 31, neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of A-C-C-H-O. Verse 33, neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of beth -Shemesh. Verse 31, and the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down into the valley. But the Amorites dwelt in uh, this, these mountains at the end of did not drive out these inhabitants and because they are going to allow these inhabitants to influence their life God is going to allow these inhabitants to come back in and reconquer some of the land uh, that he had originally given to the tribe and the the whole overview of it is in chapter 2 so chapter
place of keeping and said so the angel of the Lord came and said I made you go up out of Egypt and brought you into the land which I swore to your fathers and I said you will never break and I said I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no agreement with the inhabitants of this land you shall throw down the altars and then you can underline the next phrase but you have not obeyed my voice so God said, okay, here was our agreement. I told you I would always be your God. I would always protect you. I would always provide for you. But you have to obey me. But guess what? You haven't. Why have you not done this? And so, <coughs> therefore, I I will not drive them from before you, but they will be as thorns in your side, and their God will be a snare unto you. So this is why
And I, I feel confident that it was. But there's something interesting about Christianity. It requires discipline. Many religions do not require any discipline whatsoever. In fact, they indulge the flesh. If you were lived in car ranch in the first century, then you had a temple there that was staffed with a thousand prostitutes. And you could go to the temple and you could commit <coughs> So sailors got religion when they came to the port. And so you had this religion. And you look at the religions that these people, uh, the people of Canaan, they, they were religions that appealed to the flesh. And so it was easy. I mean, you didn't have to discipline yourself. But God called on his people to obey my commandments. Do this, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, don't take your neighbor's wife, etc., etc., etc. Well, I mean, this is not a fun religion here. But these religions that the Canaanites had, it was just, you know, uh, go out and uh, have a big high old time. And it, they involved drinking, they involved sexuality, and so it was appealing. I mean, you remember.
know that things in Texas go haywire, right? And that's going to be the story of the period we're just. I just had an observation. Uh, these people <coughs> went into these cities and they didn't drive out all the inhabitants. They, they did enough where they thought, well, this is good enough. Yeah. And they didn't think the remnant of people there would be a problem. So you have that next generation and they're saying, oh, well, they're not so bad. These other people are not so bad. We went so to bad. school with them. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's exactly and right. They, and they're, God took care of getting in, but it was easy for that next generation to forget about God. And so the environment changed, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there wasn't this uh, deep desire to please God and serve God. So now, you know, you got a house in Fort Hedges, you know, and there's too many trees. you got money to buy. You know, whatever. So you don't need God. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baal. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them and smoked the Lord with their feet. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. So, in the margin of your Bible right there, by verse 11, 12, 13, you can write sin. And now, guess what's coming next? Watch it. The anger of the Lord, verse 14, was hot against Israel. He delivered them into the hand of the spoilers that spoiled them. He sold them in the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Uh, wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, they were greatly distressed. So there's servitude. And guess what's going to happen next? They're going to be sorry, right? Mm -hmm. So beginning in verse 16, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that uh, spoiled them. So actually sorrow kind of fits in between the two, and we're going to see it. Uh, I've got it written all the way through the book of Judges in my Bible, and you're going to see it. Uh, but salvation is going to be the Lord raised up judges, so that's going to be the way <laughs> Sorrow is going to fit between verse 15 and 16. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but went uh, whoring after other gods, bowed themselves down to them, turned quickly out of the way which their fathers had walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not do so. The Lord raised up among them judges, uh, and the Lord was with the judge, delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge, for it repented the Lord because of their groaning by reason of them that oppressed and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead, guess what? Turn to cycle, cycle number 136, <laughs> right? That they returned, corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods that served them and bowed down to them and did not see from their own ways nor from their stubborn ways. Israel, he says, because this people has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, have not hearkened my voice, I will not from this day on drive out any more before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk in it, as their fathers did keep it, or not. Therefore the Lord left these nations without driving them out quickly, neither delivered he them into the the setting. From here on, we're going to have one judge after another, after another, after another. And it's going to be, it's not going to be the whole land every time. It's going to be sections of the land. See, you had the Hittites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Amorites, and all, I think there were seven different ites in the land. So different ones are going to be allowed to come back in and repossess sections of the land. And then God will raise up a judge to deliver them. And so that's going to be the cycle of it's the cycle of nations and it's the cycle of people. Sin, servitude, sorrow, and salvation. And until God brings a serious enough judgment on 
Like the 